Hawa. Matthew 12, 1. At that time, Jesus went out on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were and hungered, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Deuteronomy 33, 28. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Isaiah 36.17 Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Shalawan, mi familia. Thank you for being here once again. I got a, well, very interesting video to me, at least. Uh, hope you guys like it. It's regarding corn, but uh, hopefully towards the end of the video, you would see that it has something to do with something that's way more important. And, you know, and uh, in the beginning, we, we read these three verses, right? We had Matthew 12, 1, Deuteronomy 33, 28, and Isaiah 36, 17, talking about corn. What is the significance about this? Uh, some of you may know right away, uh, because you know that um, corn is native to America, right? So why are there so many references of corn in the Bible? In the Old Testament. Old Testament, right? It's supposed to be B.C., right? And the New Testament as well. That's supposed to be in Jerusalem over there. During those times, supposedly, as they teach us, corn wasn't over there yet. Because they teach us, uh, straight up, they lie to us that Columbus introduced corn to that side of the world when he came to America. And he brought it back with him all right so you know we know the fairy tale now we're going to show you some other uh documents some other records some other research right by other people scholars that you know had common sense to uh investigate and do their own studies right we're going to see how corn is uh all over the old world the so-called old world you know uh, we're going to see them in India, all over Asia, you know, Syria, Babylon. And um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, of course, link this with the Bible, right? Ancient uh, Egypt comes out in the Old Testament, right? So, as we already have shown in the past videos, you know, um, the ancient world was on this side of the earth, you know, on this side of the planet, the Americas, right? We showed you in the city of David video Jerusalem was in Peru the ancient Hebrew copper colored tribes we have all the documented evidence showing the lost tribes on this side so we're gonna use corn as another angle we're gonna come at them with another angle using their research alright so they can't keep this truth silent anymore here we go welcome to the program on Egyptian maze I'm Gunnar Thompson I will be your host and your guide as we follow a track of clues all across the world trying to solve the mystery of Egyptian maize. That was an individual by the name of Moses. Well, the Bible says that Moses wandered about in the Sinai Desert for 40 years. Uh, the big problem was that the tribes of Israel were also following around behind Moses, and that means everybody was lost for about 40 years. Well, the Sinai Desert just is not all that big. If you've got a good supply of water and a decent camel, you should be able to cross it in about a month. But they wandered around for 40 years, and they were following what they believed was what they should be doing. It was written down in stone, the laws, and Moses was looking for the promised land. Well, perhaps he was looking in the wrong place. Perhaps the promised land was, as many historians in the 18th century finally realized, the promised land was North and South America. 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 There you go, you heard it. <laughs> the promised land was North and South America. So these ain't my theories, all right? So who's this Gunnar Thompson, right? Let's see, because uh, we're going to use his research a lot. He did a lot of good research, and we have to uh, know this, man. He did it for us to know, you know? Um, so his work doesn't go in vain, you know? He didn't die in vain. So, this is Gunnar Thompson, 
says here, author of Controversy. Here is Gunnar Thompson, surrounded by New World Discovery books and ancient maps in this 2014 portrait by the renowned Oslo photographer, Magni Bolstad. As Gunnar satisfied himself through his research, ancient America was the happy hunting ground of ancient uh, Egyptian pharaohs, a bonanza for Roman merchants and a sanctuary for refugees from all across the globe. In 2005, Hong Kong entrepreneur Frank Lee called Thompson the Sherlock Holmes of world history. Gunnar Thompson was something of a time detective whose enduring passion was to uncover the secrets of the past. A longtime resident of the Pacific Northwest, he was an academic, a world traveler, an archaeologist, an anthropologist. He served on the faculties of seven universities in the United States but also spent a lifetime doing uh, independent research into early voyages and cartography. His study of ancient maps, along with the history of cartography, put him in a unique position to challenge many of the assumptions that are perpetuated, perpetuated cautiously by historians and educators. Okay, so <laughs> you see where this research is coming from. All right, so it's in my theories, okay? Let's go. Man Across the Sea, Problems of Pre-Columbian Contacts by Carol L. Riley, J. Charles Kelly Campbell. It says here, Pre-Columbian Maize in Asia. Ze Maize. Alright, so Ze Maize is an American plant, but there is, an, there is considerable evidence that maize was cultivated in Asia even before Columbus discovered America. Because maize is incapable of self-propagation, its presence wherever it is found implies an introduction by man. Okay, it doesn't grow in the wild. It needs man to grow it. That's what it's telling us, okay? The issues of who initially brought maize to Asia and by what routes are, however, beyond the scope of this paper. See Jeffries, 1963. The antiquity of maize in the East Indian archipelago had 150 years ago impressed Crawford, the British resident at the court of the Sultan of Java in 1808. As a result of his investigations in the Indian archipelago, archipelago Crawford was convinced that maize had been cultivated there before the discovery of the Americas and concluded that maize was indigenous to these islands. Crawford, 1820, 1-365. Alright, so He's saying that because he was so convinced it been it had been there so long, even before Columbus had gone to America, that it had to have been indigenous to him because he couldn't imagine anybody bringing it over there or maybe the times when the continents were together, you know, and everything was just moving back and forth like nothing from America, the old world, okay? So let's continue. All right, so we find written in this book here, it's called The Wheat Plant. Its origins, culture, growth, development, composition, varieties, and something, something. It says Indian corn, its culture, etc. This was written in 1860 by John H. Clippart. All right, 1860. All right, let's see what it says. Native country of the maize. History sheds so few beams of light on the origin of the maize that it is as yet doubtful whether this most prolific and beautiful of cereals originated in the old or the new world so you see they're having trouble deciding what where it's coming from why according to some writers the introduction of maize into Europe is connected with the discovery of America in the opinion of others it may be traced back to earlier ages okay Bach the first botanist who spoke of the maize in a German book printed in 1532. You hear this? 1532, 40 years after the discovery of America, says that the, this plant was brought by Arabia Fortunata into Germany and that it was named wheat of Asia, tall wheat and tall reed, Stipa Magna. Toward the same time, Rule and Fuchs confirmed the assertion that it came from the East. This wheat, says Fuchs, has come from foreign countries, from Asia and Grecia, from Greeks, free Greeks, right? It passed into Germany, and which caused it to be named Wheat of Turkey, because the Turks now hold the whole of Asia, and it is on account of the country whence it was derived that the Germans called it Turkish Wheat. Donisir Tabern, uh, Nat Montanus, and other botanists repeat this assertion. 
The latter gives to the maize the name of Turkish wheat of Asia, frumentum turkicum. All right, so <laughs> these words are big, right? But we're going to learn about the Turkish wheat. This is why I wanted to read this right away and about the frumentum uh, turcicum or turkicum, right? So we're going to see that corn was called Turkish wheat, Indian wheat, turkey corn or Indian corn. And we're going to see why, because it was, you know, reference to have been brought from the side of Asia, not from America or Columbus or the West, right? And historical documents. We have today and day telling Britannica Encyclopedia telling us that this um, Columbus discovered it, but historical documents is telling us something else, all right? Not just from one country, many sources, many countries, all right? So let's continue. This here is the Alberton de Verga map. It's a map that uh, I found back in 1995. I brought it out of hiding and I, I introduced it to the scientific community. Now, the important thing about this map, it, it was made by Alberton de Verga, who was a Venetian, in 1414. And it's a secret commercial map. But it shows up here, this is north of the British Isles. Here's the British Isles, Spain, Norway, Africa, Mediterranean, Italy. North of the British Isles, we have this orange or red continent, and it sticks out from Norway. Well, there were many names for this ancient continent. The Norwegians called it Norveka, or Dusky Norway. The Irish called it Hibernia Major, or Great Ireland. And the Scots called it Estopeland, or New Scotland. This is interesting to me, right north and west of the British Isles, because in Europe during the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the merchants from across the seas, from this land area that appears on this map, they were bringing maize and turkeys across the ocean, across the Atlantic Ocean. And these were being introduced into Northern Europe. Well, there's a number of names that the Northern Europeans had for maize. One was turkey corn, and that's because the corn was fed to turkeys. Another name was Welsh corn, and that's because merchants from Wales were bringing the corn across the Atlantic. And another term was Indian corn, and that's because many people thought that it was India that was located across the sea. Now, uh, when referencing uh, India, it's interesting because, um, as it says here, let me read it says I will present in the same order those which might establish the American origin of the plant and with this assumption show that the name of Indian weed came to our forefathers from the idea that the new continent was a part of the Asiatic regions comprised then under the general name of India so you know there's a you're gonna read we're gonna read right now but you know the in the old world special medieval times they used to have the reference of the three Indians the rest of the world was considered the three Indians so there wasn't just in reference of what we think of India like the one we see today in the maps and the country India but it was actually the rest of the continent and as we can read from the book uh, Lost Tribes and Promised Lands from Ronald Sanders it says here in the top I'm just starting in the middle it says um, in the uh, apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas the Apostle, moves easily between Persia and India, starting roughly with the 5th century apocryphal writer, the pseudo Abdias, who described the exploits of the Apostles Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew in each of the three Indias. This latter concept became the standard one in the Middle Ages. One of the three Indias faced Ethiopia, according to the pseudo Abdias. The second faced Persia and the third occupied the ends of the earth between the ocean and the realm of darkness. This third uh, became especially fruitful for the geographical imagination, the region of untold islands in which the pl plural term Indias etymologically, etymologically one and the same as Indies okay, came to the rest for the one for all. So you, you're hearing this, right? So there was three Indias. There was one even referred to as one uh, that went uh, to the ends of the earth between the oceans and the realms of darkness or f far away, right, for the uh, these Europeans. Uh, they didn't know where it was. Uh, it had a region of untold islands, right? The Indias or the Indies, right? The West Indies, Caribbean, all right? You're hearing this, right? So it says, 
and just to add here in the bottom it says valid definitions of the three Indias among medieval geographers but for most Europeans even learned ones the term covered a vast and distant region of dark-skinned peoples culminating in a countless array of islands in one direction and, and Ethiopia the biblical Kush in the other okay you hear this so it wasn't even it wasn't just that it, the rest of the contents were referred as to the three Indias but it's telling you that dark-skinned people lived in these places okay so let's continue two kings 4 42 and there came a man from Bal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk thereof and he said give unto the people that they may eat Psalm 72 16 there shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth Asia Minor will be found to be the point from which maize spread eastward into Persia and China and westward into Europe in this area there is such a plethora of maize names that it is difficult to trace whence maize came in Turkey maize has several distinct names Rus or Kokorus Bulgar, Dura Shamai, or Dura de Siri, and Bodai Misir. The Rus and Kokoros names suggest that some maize reached Turkey from the region of the Bulga Delta in the northeast. The name Bulgar indicates that some maize penetrated Turkey from Bulgaria in the west. In Bulgaria, however, maize is known as Kukurusa, which indicates that maize reached Bulgaria from the east. The names Durha, Shamai, and Dura, the city, mean Sorghum of Sham, a city in Syria called Dama Sakus, by the Turks. Bodai Misr means Wheat of Misr, or Egypt. Here the name suggests that some maize entered Turkey from Egypt. Only Bulgar is associated with Europe, but Europe as an introducer of maize to Asia Minor can be excluded. All right? So, you know, they're telling us, you know, it's, it's, there's more documents, there's more evidence uh, it's telling us uh, throughout history that it has entered through Asia. And since Turkey was like um, in charge of that whole uh, section uh, where, you know, Asia and Europe met, you know, they, they had to lock down that kingdom, the Byzantine, I believe, time. And so, you know, they called it Turkish corn. Until 1570, all commentators on maize were agreed that it reached Europe via Asia. On this unanimity of opinion, Finan 1950, 156 remarked, For the first 30 years in which maize is discussed in the herbals, there is no mention that it had been brought in from America. During this period, the general opinion among the herbalists was that maize came to Europe from the Orient. It was not until 1570 with the herbal of Matiolus, 1570, page 305, who had seen the text in Oviedo's General and Natural History that an American origin for maize is suggested. Alright, so you, hit, you see this, okay? So this is not just me making up things. We have the uh, Britannic, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica telling us Columbus introduced it. You see how they lie to us, right? And it's our fault because we keep believing them and we keep allowing them to do this, man. But we have uh, all the information available for us to research and study. I'm just scratching the surface here. You see, uh, it was uh, unanimity. <laughs> that big word right there, unanimity of opinion, right? That the, for the first 30 years in which maize is discussed in the herbals, there is no mention that it had been brought in from America. During this period, the general opinion among the herbalists was that maize came to Europe from the Orient, not from Columbus. Okay? Wake up. Now, I, I found this book, <laughs> and I'm really glad I did. It's, it's called uh, Tantrum Botanicum, T The Theater of Plants, or An Herbal of a Large Extent. All right, this book was written in 1640. All right, so um, as you can see on the picture here, it says Turkish wheat, and that is corn, right? That's what we've been learning, right? 
Yeah, so I'm just going to read a little bit of, uh, of the inside here so you can uh, see how they uh, reference corn in that time. So it says here, the usual Indian or turkey wheat. This Indian wheat uh, showeth from root which is thick and uh, buff she, fundry, strong, tall, eight foot high, as thick as a man's uh, raft, it it grow in any rank ground, full of great joyness, with a white pitch in the middle of them. The leaves are long, twice as large and great as the millet. At the tops come forth many feather like spring, bending downwards like unto the top of millet, which are either white or yellow or blue as the grains in the ears will prove. So they're talking about the corn, the ear, right? And which fall away, nothing appearing after them, but while they are in flower at the joints of the flakes with the leaves from within two or three of the lower joints up towards the tops come forth the ears, one at a joint. We have many leaves folded over them. So, so the leaves that cover the, the corn smalleth at their top with a small long buff of threads of hairs hanging down at the end so it's talking about the hairs that stick out of the ears right which when they are ripe are to be cut off which fouls off the leaves being taken away the head of paris much like unto a long cone or pineapple fed, set with figs or eight ten rows of corns orderly and clothy fed together each being almost as big as a uh, peef not fully round all right so you, you you get it right turkey weed let's continue now this is a very interesting part right here it says regarding the name right it says the names it is very probable that this grain is that which uh, Theophrastus make us mention of to grow in Balearia and from my research so far I'm still digging up on this Balearia but it seems to be one of those powerful eastern kingdoms that the Greeks referred to and that was in the east was India or Asia or America right as we've seen and also they say it's one of the western atlantic greek kingdoms so uh, you know one of those mythical kingdoms uh, and it seems to be in america and it continues as which he says was reported to be as big as olive stones in pliny right pliny right you guys know a roman guy pliny pliny it says following him related the same thing out of him so he's saying the same thing that it comes from valeria right and that they're really big but alters the olive stones into ears of wheat. So he says that instead of that, he says olive stones, he says they're ears of wheat. And we've already seen how they've been making wheat, uh, uh, well, changing corn into wheat, you know, in, in the ancient uh, medieval times, because they didn't know what it was. It wasn't, it was new to them. So which show us how subject it is to error, all right? To go upon here, say, and bear report. So this guy in 1640 is saying, look, they're calling it wheat and that's error all right he's telling you 1640 uh, says for Theophratus related the gr greatest of the grains but by report which might increase by the way as it did between Theophratus and Pliny his time to be as big as wheat ears Mateo Mateolus Dodeonus and Lugdunemphis and others condemned uh, for calling it frumentum turkicum, right? We know that's corn. We learned that earlier. According to his country's uh, dialect, are found more just to be blamed themselves. For no doubt, this is this very Indian weed, which plentiful is found to grow in all the uh, track of the West Indies, yet not found naturally in any place, but planted every by the natives and it's the same with Theophratus and Pliny their frumentum or triticum and milbum matrionum indicum they of the wheat indies call it maiz generally okay so look they're saying that their Pliny's and Theophratus are talking about the same thing and they're saying that the Indians the same thing they're referring to as frumentum triticum uh, they said the in Indians, right? They of the West Indies, those of the West Indies, right? The third India, or the farthest, uh, the ends of the world, the the, the India that's uh, in the realms of darkness, right? Across the ocean, right? America. It says they call it Maiz generally. The, the laugh said, only remembered by Tabermentinus and Barbinibus, after him, which Aquelta. Says the Spaniards in the Indies or the Indians call Moroche. 
the drink made of maize is generally in Indies called chicha, but by some a uh, venue, the virtues. Okay, so that's uh, something we still drink. We actually make um, a beer or fermented juice, right? We call it chicha. It's fermented corn juice, and it, it you know it does get you a little tipsy because it has alcohol, like five, four, five percent, like a beer. So um, you see how there, this guy is telling you. You know, it's my easier talking about, and it is fermentum triticum, and Pliny and them are talking about. And this is 1640, so to him, this is not incontroversial. He's just correcting everybody. He's like, "Yo, it is," uh, and he can understand why there's errors. You know, the confusion because it's new to all these people. So let's continue. So we find similar names for turkeys and corn: Indian corn, Welsh corn, turkey corn, turkeys, Welsh hens, and dindons or Indian hens, and names for turkeys. Uh, and this is because the merchants were carrying these animals across the sea. And this is really intriguing to me because the mystery of Egyptian maize got its start in Scotland when a number of my colleagues, uh, time detectives, noticed that there were carvings of the maize plant or Indian corn inside Rosslyn Chapel. And Rosslyn Chapel is, no is located right in the vicinity of Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2006, I got messages from two friends who urged me to see the evidence of corn in Rosslyn Chapel in Edinburgh. Here's an aerial view of the exterior of the chapel uh, from a tourist brochure. Here's the stone vault inside the chapel. The red arrow is on a corn cob that has been carved into a stone vault. The corn cob is identified by a conical shape and parallel rows of beads or kernels arranged along the surface. This is a comparison of the Mayan corn god with Rosslyn corn. In both cases, there are rows of corn beads on the leaves. This shows a similar treatment of the artistic design. Here is an illustration of turkey corn from Fuchs Herbal of 1542. Early corn in Europe was called Indian corn or turkey corn. One reason it was called turkey corn is because it was imported to feed turkeys. Turkeys were New World farm birds that were known to the Romans and the Turks. Mark 4:28 For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after that the full corn in the ear Psalm 65:13 The pastures are clothed with flocks the valleys also are covered over with corn they shout for joy they also sing The wild American turkey gobbler roamed the forests of Mexico and North America. It was imported to the Roman Empire along with the with turkey corn and Indian millet in parentheses, or maize as uh, it was. Carried on board Turkish grain ships, it acquired the name Turkey in Britain. In Gaul it was called uh, the Indon or the bird of India. Norse ships carried the fowl to Sweden where it was known as Kalkum or Welsh hen. Hansa merchants resumed imports of the tasty fowl in 1250. The bird was known in Germany as truth, hun or Welsh hen. Targets 1552 noted that bird feed was also called Welsh corn, indicating that it was imported from the Welsh colonies. A. W. Schroger, 1966-471 noted that ancient turkey bones were common in Ireland. All right, so you see all these references. Uh, uh, in that part of Europe, uh, that northwestern part, uh, Lincoln, uh, all those stories and all those legends they have here. We're going to get more into that. How the, you know, the Vikings and uh, all these uh, Welsh explorers and English explorers went over to America. All right, so uh, this is way before Columbus, so let's continue. During the 16th century, and probably much earlier, Germans called maize by the name of Welsh corn. According to Welsh legends, a prince by the name of Madoc established a colony in the New World during the 11th century. Probably Welsh merchants sailing between the colony and Europe brought back corn to northern European ports. And that seems like a plausible explanation for why the Germans referred to maize as Welsh corn. Legends and Lore of Ancient America, edited by Frank Joseph. It says here, the, the botanist Leon, Leonhard Fuchs, 1542, published the earliest known illustration of the maize plant in Europe with the caption Turkish corn and the scientific name Tursicum frumentum. Okay, we saw that earlier, right? At this point in time, 
Fuchs was convinced that Turkish corn originated in the Middle East. All right, so he's really convinced that this didn't come from America or it was that it was brought from Columbus. And this is in 1542, right? All right, so remember, before 1570, everybody concluded unanimously that it came from Asia. Okay, remember that. All right, so let's continue. At this point in time, Fuchs was convinced that Turkish corn originated in the Middle East from where it was shipped to European ports. There is no historical indication of any suspicion among the bot botanist associates that this common feed grain might be a New World import. Okay, A variety of other names given to the plant suggest multiple sources for early maize in Europe. Along the shores of the Adriatic Sea in Italy, a mysterious import, probably maize, was known as Grana de Brasil, or Brazilian grain. This name was mentioned in a commercial contract dated 1193. Okay, you see this? Between the Duchy of Ferrara and a neighboring town. Irish legends from the same time period tell of a land called Hybresail, Hybresail across the North Atlantic suggesting an early import of maize from the east coast of North America. Icelandic explorers called the New World grain they found near Wineland self-sown corn. This was recorded in a saga from the 11th century back home. You hear this? 11th century. It says here, maize has not been found in the wild state. Although it is such a remarkable plant, it seems improbable that with our present knowledge of plant distribution, it should remain undiscovered if in existence. This fact has made the problem of its nativity very difficult. Even though Americans have been satisfied of its New World origin for some time, competent critics have skillfully argued Old World origin, and from the strictly historical point of view, there was earlier much to be said in their favor. And as we have already heard and read, uh, you know, they did have a lot of in favor, and we're going to keep reading all the corroborating evidence from other parts of the Old World, the so-called Old World. The word maize... Uh, maize itself is strictly American, but this name has been in use only since adopted by Mati Ol in 1570. Again, remember, before that it was called Turkish wheat or all the other names. In modern European languages, the common name has been one purporting to show Eastern origin. In English Indian corn and French Bled de Turquie or Turkish wheat, since maize is not wheat, it might almost be concluded it was not Turkish and, you know, related to wheat and it creates a lot of confusion and we see that in the Bible so let's continue since maize is not weed it might almost be concluded it was not uh, Turkish the trouble was one could not prove it as a matter of fact such names only show the tendency of people simming, simply to indicate the foreign origin of an introduced article as when the French gave the name cut the Inde or Indian cock to the American Turkey according to De Candole uh, maize was called Roman corn in Lorraine and Vosges, Sicilian corn in Tuscany, Indian corn in Sicily, and Spanish corn in the Pyrenees. The Turks called it Egyptian corn, and the Egyptians Syrian dura, which prove it to be neither Egyptian nor Syrian, and as well prove it <laughs> to, to add not Turkish. And so you see this uh, word is uh, the Turks were given a lot of the uh, credit for maize because it was coming out of there that part of Asia you know they were introducing it to the Europeans but even they say it's Egyptian and then the Egyptians say it's not theirs and then if you go into Syria they'll probably say the same thing and it's gonna go back to the third India we're gonna see is America later on inhabitants of some German cities called the grain Welsh corn and it was so named in Hieronymus Box 1572 Book of Plants. Many Europeans identified two kinds of corn at the same time. There was both pancio and maíz in Spain. So pan is how we say bread in Spanish. England had Turkic corn and Indian corn. Germany had both Welsh corn and in the Indi niches corn. Indi, India, right? Indi, West Indies. The French had bled the Turkey and bled the Inde. Here, Indian referred to the so-called New India, right? The New India, right? The third India, right? The three Indias, the one that's in the farthest end, right? Across the ocean, in the dark realm. <laughs> the, 
that Columbus identified across the Atlantic. Okay, so we're talking about the same one, aren't we? And that he had named in accord with Roman traditions. So he named it New India because Romans knew it was called India. They had it in their maps. We showed you uh, Microbius map, right? And the Greek maps, right? Such multiple names are not consistent with orthodox assumptions that Maiz was introduced from a single source, such as Spaniards returning from the New World. However, these names are consistent with different kinds of maize being introduced from different sources or at different times. Venice was in active commercial contact with the Ottoman Empire. Turkish were nowhere as well known as Venice, and nowhere north of Venice was such information better known than in the towns of South Germany. The name Turkish corn was affixed after the Turks had gained control of the Levant. Note the conspicuous uh, and old usage of maize in the cuisine of the Po Valley, even today. And this kitchen usage is not found elsewhere in Europe, west of the Adriatic. Yet maize is important as a food only east of the Adriatic in the Balkans and Hungary, both of which were under Turkish control for centuries. And uh, finally, maize cultivation and usage for food are seen clear into Turkish Asia Minor. In South Austria and Vienna, maize is known as kukurus. And we're going to see how that is also known like that in India and in, uh, in Arab world as well. Which is widely used, named also in Slavic areas, including Russia. Wes Eberhard did not believe it a Turkish word. There is the suggestion that it is a transfer from the Po Valley into South Germany and thanks as Kukurus into Eastern Europe. Okay, let's continue. So continuing uh, with the reference of Turkish uh, and relating it to maize or, or wheat, right, given th that name, it says, furthermore, here in this book, uh, the name Turkish wheat or wheat of Turkey given to maize probably at the time of its introduction in which it still preserves, indicates no better its origin than the name of wheat of Egypt, Ms. Bogdai, given to it by the Turks or Dura of Syria, by the Egyptians and Sicilian grain by the Tuscans. While it is called Indian wheat in Sicily, wheat of Rome in Lorraine and Bosgis, we're going to read all this later as well, uh, Spanish wheat at the foot of the Pyrenees, wheat of Guinea or Barbary in Provence, these names uh, taken from the countries in which maize cultivated at various periods into neighboring regions prove no more conclusively its place of nativity than the names of Italian poplar and rice of Carolina uh, demonstrate the spontaneous growth of the former in Italy, of the later in America. The name Turkish wheat seems to me as improper in regard to maize as the word Turkey, fall of Turkey, used by the English to designate a cock of India. A native of America. Botanists and historians did not have to deal with the issue of the original habitat of maize until the early 17th century. You see what they're saying? They're saying that they didn't have to worry about where it came from. I mean, they were certain it had come from uh, Asia or, you know, Welsh, or England or, you know, Egypt, all those places, you know, other than America. But since they started saying Columbus brought it over, you know, now they had to rewrite their history. So now it became debatable in the 17th century. Until that time, people generally assumed that the co continents were all joined together, making it easy for plants to become dispersed over land. However, by the late 1500s, it was becoming clear to geographers that the continents of the Western Hemisphere, Amerigo Vespucci's New World, writing parentheses, and they, and they give it to him, the name, but it doesn't really come from him were effectively separated from the old world by great ocean barriers. Soon, botanists realized that plant domestication had to occur on either one side of the world or the other. The issue of where maize domestication took place was a perplexing problem. Europeans had a tradition that maize was first known as a plant from the Middle East, yet it was also clear that maize was an ancient feature of the New World. All right, so they had two different stories. All right. Several varieties of maize reached Europe during the Middle Ages. The principal conduit seems to have been from Asia Minor, across the Mediterranean Sea, in Arabian or Turkish merchant vessels. 
This grain was invariably called grano de turkey or turkey corn, mecca corn, saracen's corn, or some other variation of turkey grain, expressing the belief that the origin of the shipment was from the Middle East. And again, we can see turkey, right? We know the story. And now we see saracen's corn. Saracen was just the uh, uh, dark-skinned Asians, right? Uh, from India or Asia, right? We know that uh, America or India was considered to be part of uh, Asia back in the day, so that's why Columbus said he would reach India if he just went the other way, right? America, he knew where he was going, so let's continue. This is the Hecatius map of about 500 BC. It is one of several maps that predate the Phoenician cartography of Marinus and the Roman cartography of Ptolemy. This map has the Gulf of Mexico labeled as the Caspian Sea. A team of Greek explorers in about 500 BC issued a report affirming that this was true. This is Aristosthenes' map of about 300 BC. It has a southern continent indicated as the Altar Orbis, meaning the other world. This is an early name for South America, and it's the same name that Columbus used for South America. This is a Roman map by Macrobius, circa 440 AD. It is presently at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. The map is a very accurate Florida and Gulf of Mexico. Florida was a Roman goddess of springtime. This is an enlargement of the Macrobius map showing the Florida Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. The Portuguese had a map of the same area called Antilia, or the Antilles, in 1436. So why does Columbus get credit for discovering lands that were already known to the Romans and the Portuguese? An exemplification of the fact that Europe first obtained maize from Asia Minor, which about AD 1320 was called the Empire of the Turks or Saracens, right? Just said that, right? I give a short list of European names for maize. Italy has Grano Turco, Grano Saraceno, Frumentum Saracenium, Frumentum Asiaticum. Great Britain has Turkish corn and Tartarian wheat, Holland, Turks Tarvor, Germany. Turkish corn, Sweden, Turkish Huidi, Russia, Turetsky Shelsk, Greece has Arabosit, France, Ble de Turquie, and Ble de Astrakhan, Morocco, Shurkilla. Europe has maize names associated with Asia. Asia, with the single exception of Bulgaria, has no maize names associated with Europe. Those who claim that maize was first introduced into the Old World by Columbus, an employee of Spain, will find it difficult to explain why Spain, of all places, an early name for maíz was according to Kulak in 1849, page 831, Trigo de Turquía. So he's saying even Spain didn't call it uh, uh, American uh, corn or Indian corn from America or from the New World. They were calling it Trigo de Turquía or grain of Turkey or Turkey uh, corn, right? So... In spite of this evidence for the movement of maize from Asia Minor into Europe and into Spain, evidence available to any botanist, the late Professor Merrill, 1954, page 290, clung to the surmise, surmise that it was only after maize had been introduced by Columbus into Spain that maize moved into the eastern Mediterranean and from there along the old Silk Road. So he continued to hijack this Professor Merrill, right? Probably a Freemason that doesn't want us to know the truth. Yeah, I mean, there's a group of them, uh, right? They made a confederate, you know, they got united, they, they swore a secret oath, right? So you, you guys know all this, right? So he's probably one of them, all right? Let's continue. It says here, investigations in the Indian archipelago by Crawford. Uh, it says he was convinced that maize had been cultivated there before the discovery of the Americas and concluded that maize was indigenous to these islands. Carford, 1820, uh, volume 1, 365, he wrote, After rice, maize or turkey corn, say maize is the most important production of ag agriculture among the great tribes of the archipelago. The word jagun which I imagine to be purely native, is the term by which this plant is known. From one extremity of the archipelago to another, there can be therefore, there can, therefore, be little doubt, as in the case of rice, that one tribe instructed all the rest in its cultivation. As far as a matter of this nature is capable of demonstrating, it 
may also be conjectured that maize was cultivated in the Indian islands before the discovery of America and that the plant is an indigenous product. You see, that's how much they think it's, an, uh, you know, that since it's been there so long before Columbus, they're like, yeah, since nobody knew the Americas, they have to conclude that uh, there is indigenous to them. But it's been there for years, you know, before the land separated. You know what I'm saying? So let's continue. It says here, maize introduced by the Arabs. What was the tribe that introduced maize under the name of Jagun to the Indian archipelago? Arab trade by sea and land shows that Arabs were the distributors. Hence, a preliminary study of such trade is essential. Herf and Rock Hill, 1911, page 14, wrote, By the beginning of the 7th century, the foreign colony of Canton, mostly composed of Persians and Arabs, must have been a numerous one, for Islam seems to have been brought there between 618 and 628. By the middle of the 8th century, the Mohammedans at Canton, which they called Kanfu, had become so numerous that in 758 they were able to sack and burn the city. The Philippines and beyond. The evidence of Magellan's voyage showed that his arrival in the Philippines had been preceded by the arrival of Arabs. The early arrival of the Arabs offers an explanation for Magellan's finding maize there as a cultivated crop. On April 7, 1521, Magellan's ships anchored off the island of Cebu, and according to Robertson's translation, 1906, volume 1, 135, the Moro, Moro, right, merchant said to the king, These men are the same who have conquered Calicut, Malacca, and all India, Magiora. Moro is a form of the word Moor, used to designate Arabs and Muslims. And going back, back to this book, it says here, uh, Scandinavians called the grain, again, turkey corn possibly because it was fed to the turkey fowl. This new world bird also reached Europe in ancient times. Thus began a tradition in the northern countries that turkey corn was unfit for human consumption, yet it made excellent feed for fowls and pigs. The earliest reported name for maize in Portugal was Milo Marocco or Milo or corn of Morocco, all right? We just read about the Arabs, right? In the Indian archipelago, which suggests that the Portuguese Portuguese first got maize from North Africa. It says here, Maize and the Monday Myth by M.D.W. Jeffries. Alright, so how to get to North Africa? So we know about the Mandinka, right? Mandinka and the Inca, right? How they were in America before, right? So it says the Mandi or Mali or Mel or Mandingo, a people occupying what has been called the Buckle of Niger have a beautiful and complex creation myth that includes the appearance of Maiz and its eastward migration with them down the Niger to Lake Debo. So, the appearance of Maiz, right, and their eastward migration, right? So if you're going towards the east, that means you're coming from the west. What's west of uh, Africa? America, right? And we know how the Mandinka and the Inca are related, right? The Inca were in America, right? So, you know, you put this uh, two and two together. Eastward migration, right? If you're in Africa, what's to the west? America. Down the Niger to Lake Debo. All right, so let's continue. In their complex creation myth that it includes the appearance of maize and its eastward migration with them down the Niger to Lake Debo, the occurrence of the myth in groups now widely scattered in the Sudan suggests great antiquity. All right, long time ago, great antiquity, and where migrations can be, and where migrations can be dated a time long before the discovery of America is implied. Okay, another source here. All right, way before Columbus discovered America, these Mandinka people had corn already, and North Africa had corn already. This implication casts doubt on the traditional view that maize was introduced into Africa by the Portuguese after they had obtained it from the New World, alright? So that is bullshit too. And uh, just to continue here with uh, West Africa, it says here the plant was known in West Africa as Misr, we heard that earlier, right, from Egypt, the Arabic word for Egypt. In a letter dated 1514, 
the trader Goncalo Lopez mentioned his receipt of red corn from Sierra Leone. John Locke, a 16th century mariner, described a wheat on the west coast of Africa in 1554 that had ears with more than 200 kernels the size of peas. British seaman Andrew Batchel, 1591, wrote about wheat in Angola that was also known as Guinea weed, a common European name for maize in Guinea. The natives called this grain Masa Maputo. Maize was called Clau Eub in Sanguai and Makari in Fuli along the Niger River. In both places, maize was a central part of the culture and religion. When the tribes were first visited by European explorers in the 17th century, in 1746, British botanist Thomas Ashley described four kinds of maize grown in Angola. One variety called Masanga had ears a foot long. The other varieties were called Masambala. Maize was so widespread in Central Africa at the time of Portuguese colonization that some orthodox historians assumed the grain had come via overland routes from Egypt and the Sahara. Although some names suggest that maize was an occasional Portuguese introduction, most native names for maize, along with deep cultural traditions, indicate that maize was present in more ancient times. The earliest Portuguese reference to maize in West Africa is found in the Chronicle of Valentin Fernandez, 1502, who reported seeing Milho or Milho Sabufo along the coast. Later writers compared this plant to Mejiz of the West Indies, all right, of the Caribbean, the third India. One writer even included a sketch of a plant as maize in the 1554 book Del Navigate. E Viagi, just so you guys can research it. There you go. 1 Samuel 17 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an epa of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. Joshua 5 11. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day. Semais. The literature on the question of whether maize, semais, appeared in Eurasia before the time of Columbus has become large and contentious. Few botanists and even fewer archaeologists or historians have combed that literature exhaustively. As noted above, field investigations have discovered Odd sorts of maize grown in Asia, especially Sikkim, primitive in the remote Himalaya, and waxy varieties from Myanmar, Burma, all across China to the Korean Peninsula, mostly away from coastal areas where 16th century Iberian sailors are supposed to have first introduced maize. The characteristics and distribution of these grains cannot be explained in terms of post Columbian introduction. Because waxy varieties were not known in the Americas, uh, Mark Suski, 1975, page 78, 1987, Johansson and Wang, 1998, Collins, 1909, Stoner and Anderson, 1949, Sudo and Yoshida, 1956, and so on, right? You guys can read. Yet some unusual traits exhibited in these Asian maizes have close matches to corn known archaeologically from Peru. And we're going to touch upon this a little bit later when we start talking about the, the natives uh, and how uh, they... Um, you know the how important corn was to them or that is still being grown by native groups in peru colombia chile bolivia and argentina it says say maize origin mesoamerica summary archaeological evidence demonstrates unquestionably that this species was known in pre-columbian asia of particular interest is the discovery in an archaeological site in the island of timor of remains of maize dating to the third millennium bc so again unquestionably archaeological evidence right that this species is known in pre-columbian asia okay all right so encyclopedia britannica is lying to you your history book is lying to you columbus didn't introduce this to the rest of the world okay 
so it's dating to the 3rd millennium BC. The, there probably were separate introductions of primitive Zemais. Strikingly similar plants have been found grown in the Himalaya and interior East Asia, and more developed variety of later date. Names including Sankris names as well as art representations confirm that maize was grown in India before as well as after. A historical record also places the crop in the Middle East by AD 800. Maize may also have reached Eastern Europe as well as Africa in pre-Columbian times, although its immediate source may have been India, Middle East. Okay, more references here. It says here, case one, transfer America to Southeast Asia, time of transfer by 3rd millennium BC, it says here. It says case two, America to India, and perhaps then to China and the Middle East by the 1st century BC to India. Great A, it says. Uh, case three, transfer America to Eastern Europe. All right, so those are kind of like the three we've been actually reading about, you know, those kind of three possibilities, and could have been all three, you know, because, you know, at some point they're all connected, even when they wasn't connected the lands, these people were traveling back and forth, all right? And returning to uh, this book, it says here, The Treaties of Natural History by Li Chi Ching, written toward the middle of the 16th century, marks the exist existence of the maize in China. Within a time so close to the discovery of America, that this event must not be connected with the introduction of that plant into Asia. All right, so they're saying it's too close for it to have developed, for them to have to learn how to cultivate it and, and become part of their diet and everything. It was too close. It says here, in conclusion, the maize found at Thebes within a mummy's coffin after a lapse of 30 or 40 centuries would be a precious but solitary relic which would prove that maize existed in Africa since the earliest time. These various points being admitted, there is enough to conclude that maize was known to the old world before the discovery of America, that probably the Arabs or the Crusaders introduced it first into Europe, and that subsequently the discovery of America gave occasion for another introduction and wider extent of cultivation of this plant heretofore confined within narrow bounds. Back to Gunnar Thompson here, it says, China. Chinese sources provide the er earliest documentary indications so far of pre-Columbian maize in Asia. Du Duy Vendak, 1949, page 30, called attention to the six Chinese expeditions by sea to East Africa between 1405 and 1422. Malinde was one of the ports visited. These Chinese navigators sent to China accounts of things they had seen. Duy Vendak, 1949, page 32, records that in the years previous to the arrival of a giraffe at the imperial court in 1414, several supernatural appearances had been reported, such as vegetarian tigers, extraordinary large ears of grain, sweet dew, hmm, they're, uh, you know, sounds like the sweet corn, right? At first, this Chinese report raises skepticism, but sweet dew was also described on the East African coast by Dos Santos in 1597. Vegetarian tigers is an obvious description of the zebra by those who knew only the striped Indian tiger. The skin of the Indian tiger and that of the African zebra are superficially alike. Each has dark stripes on a light background. One is a carnivore, the other a vegetarian. As for the extraordinary large ears of grain, only maize would fit the description. The size of maize would strike the Chinese, who according to Kendall in 1967, page 355, have annually since 2200 BC ceremo ceremonially sown five kinds of seeds, wheat, rice, sorghum, ceta cetaria, italica, and soy. None of these cereals carry extraordinary large ears. This date of about 1414 for maize is not beyond the realm of possibility for pre-Columbian maize in Africa. Jeffries, 1967. Continuing, it says here, the Nan Chen Suan Chu was also published in the Ming Dynasty, 1368-1644, and attracted the attention of European scholars. The date of the first introduction of maize interested hands who persuaded W. F. Mayers, Her Britannic Majesty's Vice Council at Canton to engage Chinese scholars to search Chinese records, including the Nun Cheng Suan Chu, the Keqing King Yuan, or Mirror of Classified Research, 
published in 1753 by Chang Yuan Long in the Peng Sao Kang Mu. Continuing Hayden Geldern, 1958, page 369, discussing early maize in China, remarked, All these early Chinese reports on maize state consistently that maize came to them from Tibet in the western parts of China. So it's saying that, you know, it's not aboriginal to China. He's, he's starting to relate all the documents and uh, put them together, and he's seeing that it all corroborates, saying that it's coming from somewhere else, mainly Tibet or Western China, right? That's where India would be, right? Or Africa or Turkey or Asia, right? That, that area of Asia. They therefore call it, among other names, Si Fan Mai, Tibetan weed. Of special importance is a statement by Tieng L. Hen, Maiz, Yumai, imperial weed, is produced in Tibet. He si Fang. Its former name is Tibetan weed, Fan Mai. Since it was formerly brought as tribute to the court, it received for this reason the name imperial weed, Yu Mai. Tian El Hen apparently lived in the mid 16th century, according to Haney Gildern. So even the Chinese are saying it's not original uh, to them, the Mais, it's saying from Tibetan most likely. So I just wanted to read this real quick, uh, referring to uh, Tibet, from uh, the, it says here, Mark Suski, 1987, page 203, from the English summary, concerns an early transfer of Mais across the Pacific from the Americas to Asia or the opposite way. Supportive information includes the facts that among Miso tribes and in Bhutan, Cultivation of maize precedes, in time, rice cultivation, and maize plays an important role in local religious rituals and ceremonies. Johannesson reports, uh, personal communication, 2003, that the Tibetan Lamaist oral tradition, as told to Johannesson and Parker by high-ranking priest in Darjeeling, holds that maize was the f was the first agricultural crop given to the Tibetans by God. Okay, so what is their first crop in Tibet? What was given to them by the gods? We're going to talk about this later, about how the gods <laughs> introduced corn, right, in a lot of uh, mythology, but uh, staying on topic here says it was the first agricultural crop in Tibet, and Chinese are saying that most of uh, their uh, wheat or corn was coming from Tibet, right, the imperial wheat. It says, although the altitude is too high for the production of maize near Lhasa, maize is involved in worship there in the largest temple. This consists of the placement erect in a large basin of rice in front of the largest figure of Buddha, of the largest ear of maize that can be found in northern India. Look it up, people. Collected fresh each year, it says. All right, so now let's continue with the uh, Asia. And continuing here, it says, Maize has always been regarded as an alien plant in the Middle East and in China. Everywhere the names given to the plant identify maize as being brought in by traders from some nearby country or from far away. Alright, so you see, it keeps saying that it's not original in any of the countries that it, they, they, they find it in, that they're growing it in, in its parts of Asia, in Europe, in Africa, India. Alright. Usually the folklore associated with the alien grain specifies that the people who brought the maize arrived at some remote time in the distant past, all right? In the remote distant past. It was not the local historians in China who regarded the Yumai corn as being an indigenous cultivar. It was the 17th century botanists who thought the maize was so thoroughly ingrained into the farming culture and the cuisine that it must have been there forever. So you see in the Europeans saw that it was part of their diet and that it was you know everyday life for them you know corn and maize in china so that he thought it was indigenous there because it was obviously there before columbus right so the peasants would have agreed with that assessment as far as they could remember their ancestors had always farmed yumai maize is recorded in chinese medical encyclopedia of ad 1448 which gives detailed guidance on the curative use of corn, silk, and seeds. This would not have been true of recently acquired plant. According to Burkhill, 1966, the reported treatment with maize products is still used in Southeast Asia for renal problems. Actual maize ears were reported taken from a tomb excavated in Sichuan province, said to date about 2000 uh, BP Han Dynasty. 
The only documentation was in newspaper, but the find was known to a number of archaeologists. Because of the prevailing assumption by established scientists of a late date for maize, administrators did not allow the ears to be submitted for carbon-14 dating, as requested by the field archaeologists, and the specimens were discarded. So they didn't fit with history, you know, the fake history they teach us. So they was like, no, no, don't test it. Just scrub it up. You know, put it in a news article. Okay, that's enough. Let's let's just hide it. And continue here a little bit towards the middle. It says some ancient maizes have likely existed in Asia for a long time. References to maize in the 13th century A.D. literature in China and note 170 and 5th century A.D. literature in India and note 171 suggest much earlier introduction in Asia. A series of caves in Timor, Indonesia have continuous sequence of occupation from 12,000 BC to the time of Christ. That date is an error, according to the reference source, Glover 1977. In the top layers, according to Glover, dated to the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, several in introduced New World crops occur. Glover supposes from the Northwest, such as peanuts, arrakis, custard, apples, soursop, Anona and maize, se maize, together with Southeast Asian or generally Asian natives for complete information, see Glover 1977. All right, so they're saying that there's a lot of uh, evidence there of maize from the third millennium BC again. Continuing here, it says uh, the second century BC chronicle of Ningpo mentions a grain that paleobotanist Henrich uh, Bresch Nider 1870 identified as maize. Court historian Wang Yu Qian's 6th century account of the mysterious voyage of the Afghani monk Hui Shen to a land called Fu Sang might be a description of Mai circa 500 CE. According to Yu Qian, the monk returned from an overseas voyage with seeds from the, with a the new plant that had leaves similar to an oak, a stalk similar to a sugar cane, and a reddish pear-shaped fruit, maize. The Chronicle of An Wei, dated 1511, mentions maize as a barbarian grain. A few decades later, barbarian, right? Barbary, North Africa. A few decades later, a woodblock illustration in the Pen Sao Kungmu book of plants called maize a gem like sorghum or a cereal from Shek Wan that was like a precious stone, Shu Yu. Inhabitants of other provinces called maize imperial weed again the reference of imperial weed because it was given as a gift to the kings of the emperor i have documented several examples of maize in china going back to the first century use of oxen to plow rows of maize is a characteristic of cornrow planting and not millet which is typically planted like a grass by sowing in the broadcast fashion the evidence we have seen in the british isles egypt nigeria india and china all indicate that the ancient travelers had spread maize agriculture all across the world prior to Columbus. Hosea 14.7 They that dwelt under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Isaiah 17.5 And it shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. And so we're almost done with this part of the uh, video with you know the corn in Asia. Uh, we're going to get into India and the great work of some other uh, researchers, Johansson. Uh, and the overwhelming proof coming out of India. But for now, let's just continue and finish up uh, with this part of Asia. And it says here, A Han Dynasty tablet shows it a distinct row of tall grains plants that were grown in plowed furrows. This is a strong endorsement that the grain is maize. Some scholars have suggested that the Han tablet shows foxtail millet. However, millet was typically scattered broadcast fashion across fields and not grown in rows. Han corn was so large that it made uh, the single cob at the top droop towards the ground. Mangeldorf, 1974, has noted that this is also a characteristic of the arcade American variety of maize. A Song Dynasty ceramic mural clearly shows a maize ear 
complete with a yellow cup and green husk leaves. All right, you hear that, right? Song Dynasty. The botanical illustration of Shek Wan Millet, Shoyu, Shoyo, Shochoyu, was printed in the early 16th century. It's too early to be a result of Portuguese introduction, as the doctrinaire scholars have claimed. Okay, the indoctrined scholars that and they indoctrinate us when they teach us, supposedly. Recently, a volunteer for the 1421 team, Ed Liu, has reported that Mais was known as Ju Mai, jade like corn, for thousands of years. For thousands of years. Mais. You see the word, the root word, Mais, a Taino word, we're going to read that later, but Ju Mai, for thousands of years. Okay? This corroborates the discovery of the word Yumi for jade rice or Mais. In the 14th century poem, Uchibayashi, 2005, use of the word Ma'i for Ma'i suggests ancient contact with seafarers who used such words as Mash, Meshi, Mush, or Masa for corn cornmeal porridge. Very interesting words there, right? So, from our past videos, right, we know what Meshi, Meshek, Meshi means, right? Moses, Moshe, Mash, America, the promised land. Right, well, uh, Gun Gunner Thompson said earlier, right? That word, masa, maiz, masa. We're gonna see how the Egyptians, um, the Greeks, and Romans, and all these people use the word masa, and how Spanish people use masa for uh, the corn dough, right, to make the breads and everything, just like the Greeks, the Egyptians. All right, let's continue. The Portuguese name uh, Milo is absent even though orthodox historians assume portuguese traders introduced the new grain whether or not outsiders inspired the agriculture use of maize there's evidence that it was already a religious or medic medicinal plant statues found in buddhist caves dating to the sixth century have garlands over their shoulders that were made to look remarkably similar to maize cups maize is definitely f uh, featured on a ceramic mural in Shanghai province where a foot-long yellow cub with kernels has long leaves at the base California State University professor Sidney Chang identified the mural as 9th or 10th century design in 1422 Chinese naval officers reported seeing extraordinary large ears of grain on voyages to Africa and India thus the Khan's mariners had ample opportunity to bring home samples of maize already grown in the old world. Okay, you, you see all these uh, accounts, right? When does it start becoming facts? Other than just theories from one or two or three people. I mean, these are historic documents in, in these countries' history. Alright? It says here, an encyclopedia of plant diffusion this book should end the controversy over early voyages to the New World. If the mainstream professors ever become bold enough to look through Galileo's telescope at 600 pages, the book is crammed with scientific information regarding cultivated plants that the ancient mariners took back and forth across the oceans. Maize is one. Maize is only one of many vital crop plants that made the journey. The authors give evidence showing conclusively that maize, uh, peanuts, potatoes, tobacco, cocaine, hashish, sunflowers, gourds, chilies, cotton, and grain, amarath, were among the plants that the ancient travelers brought across the seas. With respect to maize, the authors include a photograph from a stone uh, bas relief carving made in Java that distinctly shows the maize plant over 500 years before Columbus. Okay, another source here. Another photograph shows a Han Dynasty ceramic bird that was modeled over a corn cup almost 2,000 years ago. When the mold was fired, the corn cup dis disintegrated into ash, leaving behind the distinct impression of the ancient corn cup. The mold is now in the Xingchang Archaeological Museum, 493. Several of Johansson's photographs, all right, we're going to go into Johansson's again, right? This great researcher uh, and the research he did in India, right? Says, 
Uh, he has photographs of stone carved maize plants from central India dated from 1100 to 1300 AD. They're also included. They show the distinct features of corn silk, husk leaves, conical cobs, and parallel rows of kernels. Staff at the U.S. Department of Agriculture office in Ohio in 2008 stated that maize is what is represented in all specimens displayed on the Indian temple art. Okay, so this is not con conspiracy, <laughs> not, no con controversy. This is not fake. This is not just somebody's theory. Like this guy went out to India. I'm gonna show you all these pictures, and he proved it, man. He, he I mean, it was right in front of us this whole time, right? But we were indoctrinated. We were told it was something else, myth, legends. Clearly, again, it says here the U.S. Department of Agriculture office in Ohio, right? 2008 stated that the maize was what is represented by all specimens displayed on the Indian temple art. There's no doubt, all right? This is before Columbus. Your teacher's still lying to you. Your Encyclopedia Britannica still says Columbus brought it over there. Your professors in college still follow that. And all the botanists who follow the Columbus doctrine also are lying to you. It's right in front of them. If I could figure this out, they could too. I don't got no college degrees. They studied. How come they ain't saying this or reading this or putting this together like I am? All right, so where is the conspiracy? Deuteronomy 11:14, That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the later rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Psalms seventy-eight twenty-four, and it had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven 